know the true and the living God and we know his word and some foundational things in our lives so that, so that we know what this rejoicing evermore really is and what's it all about. And, and how does it work in my life? Pray without ceasing? You know, I was taught that that means pray all the time and pray 24-7. But if that's true, I'm violating the scriptures right now because I'm not praying. I have no intent to pray over the next 40 or 50 minutes. I'm going to share what Jesus has done in my life and his word. I don't believe that means pray 24-7. Pray without ceasing means when you're believing God for something, don't give up, don't give in, and don't give out. You stand on the promise of God till you see it come to pass. It doesn't matter about your understanding or your emotions and the warfare that goes on when you're trusting God and you're praying for something. You pray without ceasing, meaning you don't let go of that promise of God and you fight now the good fight of faith. Sometimes it's a fight to believe God because of your emotions. It's a fight to believe God when people are telling you you don't know what you're talking about. It's a fight to believe God when your circumstances are warring against what God has promised in his word, and yet, and yet you can pray without ceasing. Somebody said, well, how long do you have to stand and how long do you have to pray? Till you get it. Till you get it. Well, how long does it take for God to answer my prayer? Till you get it. How long does it take for me to come from Oklahoma to Springfield, Illinois? Till I get here, that's how long it takes, Amen. <laughs> We had so many setbacks and issues, and if you fly, it could take this much time. If you, if you drive, it could take this much time. If I'd have come by horse and buggy, I, I wouldn't be here now, amen? So what's the answer of how long does it take to get from Oklahoma to Springfield, Illinois, till you get there is the answer. How long does it take to see your healing manifest? How long does it take to see your finances turned around? How long does it take to get restoration for my marriage, Pastor? How long does it take to see my kids come back to the things I sowed in them and believed and they've gone awry? Till you get it, saints. Pray without ceasing. Amen? Amen. Notice again the next verse now says, In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Thanksgiving is so powerful in my life and in the Bible, and in the life of faith, and learning to walk by faith and not by sight. You know, your name and the name of your church is Abundant Faith. How many of you know if you're going to call yourself Abundant Faith, you better have some, amen? You don't need to be an abundance of unbelief, abund abundance of murmuring and complaining and belly aching about the challenges of life. No, you need to have an abundance of faith. Well, where does faith come from? It comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says. So when I'm going through something and struggling, I need to hang on to the word of God. I need to pray without ceasing and I need to discipline my, my heart, my mind to in it give God thanks. You may be going through again uh, a sickness. You may be going through a setback in your career. You may be going through and you can fill in the blank with the many things that we're all going through the bottom line is you have to learn to in it give God thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What I may be going through may not be God's will for my life, but in it it's God's will that I focus on him and that I give him thanks in it. Notice it didn't say give God thanks for everything. I don't have to give God thanks for somebody that just got raped or thank God for cancer or thank God for uh, a child that just got molested or thank God for somebody just got murdered. I don't have to thank God for evil. I don't have to thank God for darkness, but I have to thank him in it for my victory, for his love for me. I have to learn to thank him in it for his faithfulness to never leave or forsake me, for his word that is eternal and that there is nothing that has happened to me or can happen to me that can change the divine providence of God in my life and my ultimate destiny of total victory. Even death, the worst thing that could happen to me, the worst thing that could happen to you would be death. And even in death, listen to me, death doesn't have the final word. Death doesn't have the final say-so. That even in death, I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me because in death I leave my body and I am present with the Lord and the Lord's bringing me back when he comes to this earth 
and I have the certain hope of the resurrection and that at the resurrection, God is going to make right every wrong that's ever been done to me. God is going to make right every wrong that's ever been done to you. God is going to make right every wrong that's been done to every man from Adam all the way till now. He's going to reconcile all things unto himself and we are going to have a new body. We're going to have a new heaven, a new earth, and we are going to reign and rule on this earth with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We are winners in Jesus. We are victors, not victims, in faith and in this man, Jesus. I have learned that in everything, I can give God thanks. In the confusion that comes with a trial, in the confusion that comes with a tribulation, in that, that pain that comes with the sufferings that we incur in this life, I can say, thank you, God, for being with me in it. Thank you for giving me a promise in it. And thank you for comforting me in it. And thank you for showing me the way of escape. And thank you for making me a better person in this, not a bitter person because of the grace of God in my life. I want to share some practical things concerning, again, trials, tribulations, and, and learning to trust God. Learning to believe God in them. Now, because of time constraints, and I wish I could elaborate actually a few services on this, but I want you to write down this passage, Romans 8, 28. It is one of the most misunderstood passages in the Bible and misapplied passages in the entire Word of God. There are people that have never read the Bible in their life that can quote Romans 8, 28. It is amazing to me. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. And then the next verses, if you'll read that entire chapter, it goes into the purpose of God and the predestination of God and the foreknowledge of God. And it talks about in verse 29, whom the Lord foreknew, him, him they, he also predestinated to be conformed into the image of his dear son. That is your destiny. That is my destiny is to be conformed into the image of Jesus. God's will and plan for our lives is that Jesus be seen in us and Jesus be known in our lives as we walk through real life, trusting God and, and yielding, yielding to God. And we know that all things work together for good. It didn't say, and we know that all things are good. All things are not good that happen in this world. All things are not good that have happened to me and that have happened to you. It didn't say that. And it didn't say that, and we know that all things are God. All things are not God that happen to people in this world. There is a God and there is a devil. There is a lion or he that roams around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There's good in the world. There's evil in the world. There's light, the children of light, but there's darkness all around us. And bad stuff is happening to good people all the time. All the time. What he did promise me was, and we know that that all things work together for good to, number one, them that love God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. People who say they love God and don't even read the Bible or care about it don't really love God. And things aren't going to work together for their good. Man, people that are out and about doing their own purpose, things aren't working together for their good. They're bitter people. They're miserable people. And on and on I could go. But see, to those who love God, he says... And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. His purpose is that I be conformed into the image of his dear son. That people see Jesus in my heart. That people see Jesus in my life. The world is looking for Jesus, saints. And God intends for them to find him in the church, in your heart, in your life. You know, if I'm looking for Pastor Doss, it's usually safe to find his body. If I can find a man's body, I can find usually Doss in his body. Amen. Y'all need to stay in your body. Can I get a witness? Amen. So when I find Pastor Doss, though, I'm not caught up in his body. I'm not concerned about his body. I don't talk to his body. I talk to him, the Doss that's in the body. People are looking for Jesus. And where should they find him? They should find him in his body. Which body ye are. Hallelujah. People should see the Lord in your life because you have issues like they have, but there's something different in your life. There's faith. There's love. There's the grace of God. 
they're not going to find Jesus because you are some freak that doesn't have any issues or problems because that'd be a freak. No, you got, you got issues too, but there's something different about you. You have situations coming against you, but there's something different about you. It's the very life of Jesus on the inside of you. That's what makes you different. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world as his body now on the earth. And so we've got to, we've got to understand some of these basic principles of what God is doing. No matter what happens to me, it's not that God does bad things to me. It's that all I got to do is get up and bad stuff is out there. And God is committed to be with me to turn everything that's bad that comes into my life for my good. He's going to bring good out of it. It doesn't feel good, though, when bad stuff happens to you. Amen or oh man. What, what does feel good is the hope of knowing that God is with me in this. He didn't throw me into this issue or situation or put this bad thing on me. He's with me in it to comfort me and strengthen me through it and to bring me out on the other side, a better person, a different person by the, by the faith that I'm exercising as I walk through the issues of life. Let me show you some scriptures here in Romans chapter 5. Go, go there. Can I get a witness that Romans 5 came before Romans 8? I need a witness in this house. Hallelujah. We're in agreement for sure on that. I know that that chapter 8 has blessed me so much because that chapter goes on to talk about whom the Lord uh, predestinated, he called, and he justified. And then it, it goes on to, and we sang it. I was so blessed with the song that who can be against me? If God be for me, who can be against me? See, that's not saying there won't be people against you, there won't be circumstances against you. It means if you really know God's for you, who gives a rip who's against you? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That it doesn't matter what or who's against me. If God is really for me, man, I'm, I'm fixing to win this, this fight, this battle. And so he talks about what shall separate us from the love of God. He says, shall tribulation? No. Persecution? No. Affliction? No. Angels? No. Peril? Sword? Nothing. He said, I'm persuaded that neither life nor death nor anything else will separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now listen to me. This is important. Very, very important. Every problem that comes into your life, every trial that comes into your life is the enemy trying to separate you from God's love for you. He's trying to discourage you in whether or not God loves you. Here's what will happen to everybody. It happens to everybody. You'll go through a, a trial. Something will happen. A tribulation, an affliction, a problem. And the first thought you'll have in your head is, if God loved me, why'd my mama die? If God loved me, why did cancer attack my body? If God loves me, why do my kids hate me? If God loves me, why'd my spouse leave me? If God loves me, you fill in the blank. Every time we go through a problem, we hear in our head, if God loves us, why'd this happen? The truth is, saints, listen to me carefully. In any trial, tribulation, or affliction, God's love for you is not on trial. Your love for God is on trial. God's love for you has already been tested, and he got an A+. Plus. It was tested at Calvary. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that's how God proved he loved us. His love for me was tested at that cross. And he proved his love. He showed his love while I was yet a sinner. Christ died for me, saved me. God's proved his love for me. I don't care what I understand or don't understand. He's already proved his love for me. I don't care what I feel or what my eyes are telling me. God has saved me. I'm born again. He gave me his son. He gave me his spirit. He gave me his armor. He gave me his kingdom. He gave me his name. If God withheld not his only son, how shall he now with him not freely give me all things? God isn't holding out on you, darling. God hadn't held out on me. God has blessed you. God has blessed me. God is for you. Well, I don't understand. I know, but God is for you. Yeah, but I don't feel it. I know, but God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? 
That's what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. It's what it means to in everything give thanks. It's what it means to rejoice evermore. I can rejoice not because I have all the answers. I can rejoice not because I feel something. I can rejoice because of the finished work of Calvary and God's love for me and my love is being tested. I love you, period, God. I want an A on my test. People deceive themselves all the time and they think they love God. And their heart's lying to them. They think they're committed. They think they're loyal. They think they're faithful. And I'm telling you, we know who's loyal and we'll find out who's faithful. I don't mean to, to, to minimize your pain today or minimize your trial. But there are people in Egypt right now losing their life. They're being killed because they say the name Jesus. Man, I don't know what we're going through. But we are blessed. Can I get a witness? We are blessed. Romans chapter 5. Look with me at verse 1. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what gives you peace is justification by faith. Once you see you're made righteous, not by works of righteousness, what you've done. You're made righteous with the holy, righteous God, not because of your holiness or your works, but because of the blood of Jesus. And because you have faith in Jesus, you are the very righteousness of God in Christ today. That gives you peace in your heart. He goes on to say, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We can no matter what hope and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We know a new heaven's coming. We know a new earth is coming. We know a resurrected body's coming. We know a place is coming where there's no more sin, no more Satan. We know that's coming. So we can rejoice in that no matter what. Amen? But look at the next verse. Verse, verse 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also. We're not only happy and rejoicing about what's coming, it's already a sealed deal. We rejoice in tribulation also. Now, there's got to be a place somewhere that's real. Because when tribulation comes, you don't feel good. You don't get excited. You know, if you've been working for a company for 30 years, and you got one month till retirement with full benefits, and you get fired, you ain't going to leave the property going, whoo I feel good. No, you're going to be depressed. You're probably going to be mad. You're probably going to have to do, deal with a lot of emotions. So where is this rejoice evermore? Where is this stuff real? It's not in and of my emotions. Look at this verse again. It's so incredible to me. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also knowing that. Everybody say knowing Notice he didn't say we glory in tribulation, trials, our problems, feeling this. He didn't say that. Because there's things that happen to all of us, you are not going to feel good. Your flesh is not going to rejoice. He says we glory, we can rejoice knowing that. you got to know this before you can rejoice and it be real. Know what? And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Patience in the Greek is endurance. And look at this. And patience or endurance, experience. And experience in the Greek is maturity of character. Maturity of character. See, our problems and us responding to our problems in faith and toward God will create and produce endurance. And that endurance then will develop character. Man, I can't be the only person that has looked at the church and, and, and asked the question, where, where is the character in so-called Christians today? I lament to have to report that I can't be the only one that's looked at pulpits across this country and thought, where's the character? Where's the authenticity? Where's the real deal? Where's the, the honesty? Where's character? See, character, you're not born with it. And character isn't a gift. Character has to be developed. And character is developed in hardship, looking to God, trusting God. Character is developed when we submit to God and resist the devil. So he flees. James chapter 4, verse 7. Some of you, I love you. 
I love you. Everybody say, I love. love. Brother Dwayne. Man, I love you, and I know you love me by faith. But you're ruining your kids. You're destroying your kids. You're not developing character in their life. You're trying to protect them all the time. You want them to have a life of ease and no problems and no pressure and no pain and no struggles. You build a cocoon around them. You give them everything. You're ruining them. You're destroying them. They go down to that school. They come home whining. I was on the playground, and, and, and the, all the boys and girls rejected me, and they all, they all got over in a corner and made fun of me. And you run down to that school and jump on the principal and try to get manuals made where kids are mandated to love your baby. <laughs> Instead of looking at your baby and saying, I am sorry that happened, but guess what, Hot Rod? The world doesn't rotate around you. I can't fix people. I can't fix that school. You need to go back to school tomorrow and you need to make a friend. Go show yourself friendly. I know it hurts. I know it ain't right. But you need some character. Get back in there. Put your big boy pants on and be friendly. And learn something from this. Feel the pain. Because don't you ever join a crowd and reject somebody and inflict that pain on somebody else. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Go back and do the right thing now and quit your whining. I want some Nike tennis shoes. I want you to have them. Now we're going to go to work. Work. Work is not a bad four-letter word. Can I get a witness? You don't need to be giving your kids anything. You need them to work. You need to train them to work. You need to teach them a work ethic, character. If a man don't work, he don't eat. Oh, that really flies. I don't think you heard me. Set back down. I love you. You didn't hear me. I quoted the Bible. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. You want us to feed you and you don't want to work? You go wash them dishes. A mama is not a professional dishwasher. You make your bed. You, I mean, I could go on and make everybody mad. Just talking about character. Christians are no better, man. We want to go through life and be at ease in Zion. We just want to be comfortable. and We want our flesh stroked all the time. And sometimes the best thing that can happen to you is get a whipping, a Holy Ghost whipping. Well, I ain't going to no church where they pass out whippings. Well, you ain't going to grow. You just want some feel good. Now, let it go, Dwayne. Praise you, Jesus. I got to get back to the Bible. He says, he says in verse 3, And not only so, we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation works our patience. I'm not saying God puts these problems on you. I don't believe that. A lot, of, a lot of groups do, but I don't. I don't believe God puts any bad thing on you. I believe every good gift cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I believe God is good, and people are constantly asking me because they can't put me in a camp. Who, which camp do you really belong to? What's your theology? Here's my theology. God is good and the devil is bad. Hallelujah. That's my theology. If it's good, it's God. If it's bad, it's the devil. And James 4, 7 says you got to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. If you think your problems are sent on you by God, you're not going to resist them. You're going to submit to them because you love God. And if God's doing this to me, you're just going to be steamrolled over by the devil. No, you've got to grow up and you've got to realize, wait a second, this is God, this is the devil. This is right, this is wrong. This is holiness, this is sin. I'm going to submit to this, resist this. And the dumb devil will flee. Hallelujah. And you will grow up. You will work your patience. And your patience will work your character. And your character, your hope. And your hope won't make you ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost. See, I know God loves me not because everything goes my way. I know God loves me not because I don't have any issues. I know God loves me because he gave me the Holy Ghost. So when it's bad, God still loves me. And I am not going to let the devil separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Well, why'd that happen to me, Pastor? I don't know, but I know God loves you. Well, if God loves me, why do I feel this way? Because problems hurt. Life is real. 
And God wants to comfort you in your hurt now. He wants to heal your broken hearts. He wants to walk you through these things. When you go through the fire, it won't kindle upon you. When you go through the water, it won't overtake you. We don't want no water or no fire. Everybody sit back down. Thank you for that standing ovation. How many of you know that many times the Son of God by the world is seen in the fire? There were three boys, three Hebrew boys. And you think it felt good what happened to them? You think it was right what happened to them? You think it was just what happened to them? It was horrible what happened to them. And they just come to a point that if God delivers us fine, if he don't, we still ain't going to bow down to this ungodly government. And they got tied up. Oh, yeah, you know what I really said. Praise you, Jesus. About five of you got it. Thank you, Jesus. And they got thrown in the fiery furnace. And the king asked, didn't we throw three guys in there? Then who's that fourth that has the image and looks like the son of God? Many times the world doesn't see Jesus in us till we're in the fire. I'm not saying God threw us in the fire. I'm saying God doesn't have to throw us in the fire. Just get up. Just breathe. And you're going to wind up in a fire. And the only thing that happened to those boys, it didn't kindle upon them. They didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. But the ropes that had them bound was burned off. When we learn how to end everything, give thanks. When we learn how to trust God. When we... When we turn our hearts toward God in the pain and, and in the confusion and, and in the emotional swings of discouragement and despair and say, God, I just know this. You love me and nothing will separate my love for you. I love you, God, and you are with me never to leave or forsake me. Suddenly the ropes that have held you bound for years get burned in that fire, that fiery furnace of tribulation. God works something beyond our understanding, works something beyond our comprehension when in everything we give thanks. When we glory not only in what's to come, but in tribulation also. Knowing something. Go to, go to James. James chapter 1. James, the half-brother of Jesus. Chapter, chapter 1. See, there's things in you, saints, that only your patience being worked is going to get out of you. Now, I wish I had hours to make sure I explain how God is working in these things and is specifically share biblically how God's not doing any bad thing to you. But bad stuff is happening to all of us because of the world we live in and God has made a covenant to never leave or forsake us and to work it together for our good. Somehow or another, when we trust God in our problems, what's in us in Christ begins to work its way out. Shekinah and my son-in-law are with me. And Shekinah, out of the four kids that, that I raised, she was the easiest to have a conversation with when she was little. I would just have to ask one question, and that was it. She'd take off. And I picked her up at school. She's about six years old. And it's about a 22-mile drive. And I knew the drill. I just asked her one question. And man, we had it made all the way home. She'd be telling me everything that happened all day long. Just get after it. And so she's talking along there, and I'm really not paying attention. I should have been. I'm not just being honest. I wasn't paying close attention. And, uh, and then all of a sudden she said, Peanut sitting on the railroad track. His heart was full of butter. He didn't hear the 516 toot toot peanut butter. I said, what? Where did that come from? Sounds like a country music song. A train ran over somebody and killed them. But I don't remember hearing that song. And we didn't sing that at praise and worship. Sing it again. And so she sang it again. And the bottom line is the peanut is sitting on a railroad track. And there's butter in its heart. And when that 516 hit, bam, peanut butter. Well, y'all aren't appreciating this. What was in the heart of the peanut came out in the crunch. 
You're getting it over here. Let me get back on this side. Come on now, help me out a little bit. Yeah, see, we want to believe we love God. Yeah, wait till 516 hits. We want to believe. It's kind of like a man said to me, Pastor, I'm with you to the end. The end of what? Next week? The end of the month? The only guy I ever had tell me the truth in the history of 30 years of ministry, he walked up to me and he looked me in the eye and he said, Pastor, I promise you, I'll be the last one to let you down. I didn't know he was a mortician. <laughs> That'll hit the rest of you later. Don't write me. Amen. People think they're committed. They think they're, man, I'm faithful. Yeah, we'll see. Once I hear that 516 horn coming. Yeah, we'll see. Man, I'm loyal, Pat. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not being hard or critical of anybody. Sometimes when a trial hits me, a fiery trial, a problem, something I didn't see coming, there's something comes out of me that I didn't know was in me. Areas of doubt that I didn't know I had. Areas of discouragement that I didn't know were deep down in there and I was too easily discouraged and I got to shore that area of my heart up. I'm not saying that the trial was good. I'm saying trusting God in the trial was what was good. I'm not saying problems are good. I'm saying we serve a good God in those problems to turn them around for good and to bring something of redemptive, redemptive value out of everything you face in this life. In Romans chapter 5, the New Living Translation says in verse 3, he says, he says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Anybody just been running along and, and boom, you just got a demonic slap. It's like, where did that come from? You didn't, you didn't see that problem coming. You, you weren't prepared for that. You just ran into it. Man, that happens to all of us, saints. Thank God that the word of God is forever settled in heaven and earth and that God's word is true no matter how I feel, no matter what I don't understand, I can count on God's word. I can hang on to God's word and I can rejoice in God and his faithfulness to me no matter what. Look at James chapter 1 verse 2. My brethren, talking to Christians, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Think about that. Count it all joy. You got to count it joy. Why? Because it doesn't feel joy. I got to by faith count this joy. Because I don't like it. And I don't feel good. And I don't understand why this happened to me. Amen. Count it all joy. Now watch this. Knowing this. Everybody say knowing this. Notice it didn't say, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials and tribulations feeling this. No, you're not going to feel good. He says, count it all joy when you fall into these fiery trials and afflictions knowing this. You've got to know something before you can rejoice evermore. You've got to really know something in order to in it give thanks. What do you got to know? Knowing this. That the trying of your faith, the trying of your what? Every problem that you've ever had, every problem as a believer that I will have is my faith being tested. My love for God is on trial, not God's love for me. Romans chapter 8. Watch this. Here's what happens to most of us when we have a problem. We hear in our head... If you just had more faith, if you just had faith, that wouldn't happen to you. If you just had faith, you're not going through the trial because you don't have faith. You're going through the trial because you do have faith. It's your faith that's being tried. Man, I'm preaching good. This is helping me. I'm glad I came. Hallelujah. I needed to hear this. Because that's a, if you don't hear if God loved you, you finally get that settled. Now you hear, if you just had more faith, that wouldn't have happened to you. If you just had more faith, you wouldn't have got sick. If you just had more faith, your kids wouldn't have went awry. The devil's crazy. Can I at least get a witness on that? It's not because I don't have faith that I'm being tested. It is my faith that's being tested. Now you're the good one so far at all three services. So you won't disappoint me on this. The other two surprised me. 
this is a hard concept that I'm about to say, but they got it in the other two services, and I was shocked because it takes a half hour to explain what I'm about to say. Even when I doubt, something happens and I doubt, I get excited because it would be impossible for me to doubt if I didn't have faith. You can't doubt till you have faith. So doubt says I had faith. I'm going to skip the doubt and grab the faith. Hallelujah. I used to doubt and get depressed. I'd start doubting because I'd believe one way and see it another way and then doubt. And then get discouraged about doubting. And it hit me that I have never doubted until I believed. Did you know when you were lost, you never doubted you was lost? It's impossible for you to doubt you're lost when you're lost. But the day you get saved is the day you doubt you're saved. Why? Because you are. Man, I'm preaching good. It it takes a half hour, but this is so good. There's a point in your walk of faith and your walk with God that, man, God is so good and he loves me so much and he's given me faith, but he told me, Dwayne, that faith will be tested. How will it be tested? Trials, tribulations, afflictions, persecutions. Now, what do I do? i, I got to count it all joy, knowing something. That the trying of my faith works. Patience, my endurance. Look at what patience will do. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect or mature, entire, wanting or lacking nothing. See, there's a place in real life. There's a place in the struggles of life and the pains of life and learning to navigate by the Word of God and with the Holy Ghost in which I am working my patience by faith. And my patience is developing me. It's maturing character in me. And I'm growing up. And there's a point where if I keep responding to God in all of these problems, I keep loving God still in all these problems, that I mature, I develop, and I grow. That's what causes me to say, thank you, God. Not for this problem, but I thank you in it for changing me, for your love for me, for being faithful to never leave or forsake me. When our church caught on fire and one portion of it burnt to the ground, the main sanctuary was going up in flames, millions of dollars worth of damage. I will never forget standing in that parking lot and looking at that fire and, and my heart just sink. And again, I knew I had to make a stand right then. And so here's what I said. I said, Lord, you have a problem. This is not my problem. I'm an under-shepherd, but you are the shepherd. I'm casting my care on you, for you care for me. I can't carry this burden. It's your church. Secondly, I said, here's the deal I'll make with you, Jesus. I won't leave you till we get through this. I just turned it around because I knew in my mind and that dyslexia thing I had going, I knew that I don't want to fight wondering if God is with me never to leave or forsake me. And I didn't want to fight as if it's my problem, help me. No, it's your problem, i help you. It's your problem, I won't leave you. And man, we saw the power of God turn that thing around and I didn't disintegrate. I wouldn't want to go through that ever again. But man, did I grow. Man, did I learn to harness my emotions. Man, did I learn to control my emotions instead of letting my emotions control me. Man, did I learn to settle my unsettled mind on Jesus Christ and Him crucified and His love for me. And this is a test of my faith. And, and, and with your help, God, I will pass this test. I will pass this test. Years ago, I was talking and fellowshipping with a friend, and uh, I used to really feel bad about being thin and all that kind of thing, and and so we were talking, and I said, man, I just wish I had a chest to fill out a coat. I'd like to know what it would feel like for a jacket to fit, you know, and be tight. You feel it instead of it hanging on you. And my friend looked at me and said, you can do something about that. And I said, well, what? He said, go get some weights. So I went and bought some weights. Those weights are in my loft at my house to this day. And my friend lied to me. I watched those weights for a whole year. And my chest didn't change. I went back to my friend. I said, you lied to me. 
I bought those weights and nothing. He said, Dwayne, you got to, you've got to submit to the weights and resist. Submit, resist, submit, resist, submit, resist. Some of you are really listening. <laughs> Problems do not perfect us. Trials do not perfect us like I was taught in church. If trouble and trials and problems and afflictions perfected us, we'd all be perfect. It's not the problem that perfects you. It's submitting to God in it and resisting the devil. Submit, resist, submit, resist. It's fighting the good fight of faith. And sometimes you have to fight to believe God. And the good news is it's a good fight. And I told my friend, I got enough problems to schedule pain. <laughs> and so if God wants me to fill out a jacket, he's going to have to do it supernaturally. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Look over at 2 Corinthians. I mean, who wants to schedule pain? I got enough pain without making an appointment. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. How do I relate to real problems? How do I respond to a trial? How do I re respond to affliction, tribulation again, persecutions? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, says that we have this treasure, that's Jesus in an earthen vessel. So you've got Jesus in you, saints. He's in your spirit. And after your flesh, after your outer man, you're weak. We're all weak. But in Jesus and in our spirit man, we are strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. We, we have the life of Jesus in our spirit man. But it's in this earthen vessel. So look at verse 16 for the sake of time. For which cause we faint not. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. See, my outer man's perishing. My inward man is being renewed day by day. And there are people that fight with me about that and argue with me about that, but go look at your high school pictures. Man, the debate is over. You're fading. Some of you right before my eyes. It's not a pretty picture. My outer man's perishing. My inward man is being renewed day by day. Now look at this next verse because it's overwhelming. For our light affliction which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. See, my problem when I trust God, my problem, my trial, my affliction, when I'm trusting God and believing God and fighting the good fight of faith, that is working the eternal way to glory that's in my spirit out. That's what's drawing it out. See, God is in us, but he wants to get out. And as we live life, and we're real people. And we have real issues. And we trust God in them. And we love God in them. And we love each other. And, and, and fight that fight of faith against sin. Fight the, faith, fight the fight of faith against sickness and poverty and lack and, and evil. And on and on we go. It's working that eternal way to glory. It's working that glory out of us that's in Jesus. Now the next verse is one of the most difficult verses in the Bible. Verse 18. While we look not at things which are seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now that takes explanation. I read that for years and it confused me. God, you're telling me to quit looking at what I can see and start looking at what I can't see. This is how you walk by faith. This is how... You overcome your problem. It's not by focusing on your problem. You don't ignore your problem. But you've got to deal with your problem looking to your answer, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Applying a promise of God to you by faith. And now fighting, submitting to God, resist the devil. Submit to God, resist the devil. Again, we just need to even, as, as God's people... Learn to grow in our discernment of what is God and I submit to and what is the devil and I resist. Again, you can talk to people and they're focused on their problem. I met people and I'm not being mean, but they had something happen to them 20 years ago and it's fresh on their memory. And, it, and when they're talking to you, you think it happened yesterday. 
They've been looking at it for 20 years and just meditating on it day and night, murmuring and complaining, kind of like a drunk sipping on the bottle. I can't believe that happened to me. I can't believe they did that to me. Nobody knows the problems I've seen. Nobody understands me. And man, you're in a drunken stupor. Somebody needs to put a Holy Ghost slap on you and bring you out of that drunken stupor. Love you enough to say, hey, I'm sorry for what happened to you 20 years ago, but quit looking at it. Quit focusing on it. Quit meditating on it day and night. It's temporal. I don't care what it was or is. It's temporal. It won't be in heaven. It won't be in the kingdom to come. You need to focus on You need to look at what you can't see with these eyes. That's the promise of God. That's the resurrected King, Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords, Prince of, Prince of Peace that is ruling and reigning the cosmos on your behalf now. Hallelujah. It takes faith. To see what you can't see. Amen. It takes nothing to look at your problem and your situation. And the Bible says, quit looking at what you can see that's temporal and look at what you can't see. You can't see God with these eyes. Listen, and it's hard to see God when you're hurting. It's hard to see God in a trial. But that's what faith is all about. Is that I don't care what my mind, my eyes, my senses, my feelings and emotions are telling me. God is with me in this. And God is working this together for my good. He, he will not leave me in this. He did not do this to me. He loves me and has proven his love for me. I don't have the answer on why this happened or how this happened. But I'm going to cling to the answer, Jesus Christ and his love for me. Let me close with this. Years ago, I did a lot of marriage seminars. I, I minister on the home a lot. And I would do two to three marriage seminars nearly a year uh, in, in all kinds of different places. And when you're preaching that stuff a lot, you, you, you kind of got to live, live it. You're hearing yourself talk this stuff and you're thinking, well, I got to make sure I'm doing this stuff. And so I thought, man, I want to do something special for my wife. I want to bless Sue over the top. I want to surprise her. No surprise I've ever done for Sue. 33 years of marriage. Dwayne, you don't have time for this. But 33 years of mar marriage, I have never, ever surprised her and it worked out right. It is always blown up supernaturally. <laughs> I'm talking big blow up. Every, I could tell you stories. You, you would not believe it. It's supernatural. And so I decided I'm going to bless her. She's very cold natured. I don't think she has any blood in her body because she, she can't get warm. And so I'm going to build a fireplace in the bedroom. Guys, help me out here. How many of you know when you cut a hole in the roof, you're serious? <laughs> this is big stuff. This is not coffee and donuts. I'm cutting a hole in my roof of my house. I buy this beautiful little stove, about like that, about like that, white trim, gold trim around it. I put that little stove in the bedroom, and man, the romance is flaming. I mean, I am on fire. I'm so excited about this. And the, everybody okay so far? We're talking about marriage here and how it works. And so, and so I'm excited the night of the kill had come, and... and, and I'm going to reap, hallelujah, from all this sowing. Come on now, somebody help me. I'm telling the truth. I'm excited. And so I'm going to build a fire. Well, I'm from Orlando, Florida. I, I've never had a fireplace. I don't know how to build a fire in a fireplace. So I had bought some pre-soaked fire logs. And they were three-pound logs. And so I put that first three-pound log in that fireplace, and I looked at that, and I thought, mm -mm, I want me a fire. <laughs> I put another three-pound log in that little fireplace, pre-soaked logs. Yeah, some of you are laughing already. You know what happened. <laughs> I lit that puppy, and I had me a fire. It started just growing, and I had the front door of that thing open, and it's coming out and going up the wall. I'm freaking out. I grabbed this poker that they sold me with the fireplace and I got to put this thing out. So I start beating it. Boom. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> it just got hotter and hotter. And I don't know if you've noticed, my hair is natural and it's curly and I got these spray bottles. So I went and got one of them spray bottles and I'm spraying it and I looked like I was charging hell with a water pistol. It was not working. I'm panicked. I'm freaking out. Sue's laughing, so I'm mad, and romance went right out the door. I don't know that I've ever recovered from it. Finally, Sue got in there and saved the day. I nearly burnt the house down. 
Terrible, terrible, terrible. Somebody said, what's the moral of this story? Exodus chapter 1, verse 12 says, The more the Pharaoh afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Every time Pharaoh struck the Hebrew people, they multiplied and they grew. He struck them and they multiplied and grew. Let me tell you something. The devil is stupid to the second power. And every time he hits the body of Christ, every time he hits us, the glory of God explodes in our heart. And he hits us and the glory of God.